Racial Justice Oversight Body Community Engagement Buzz Subcommittee Meeting. Um, my name is Rondell Ellis. I am uh, with Health Right 360 um, Reentry Network. And um, I guess we'll do some uh, introductions uh, starting with uh, who wants to go first? Uh, so I'm Gigi Crowder, I'm the executive director of NAMI. I'm on this committee as the faith base, so you can also call me Elder Gigi. No, I don't look like it. Marcus Walden, director of communications uh, at the Contra Costa County Office of Education, representing uh, County Superintendent Lynn Mackey. You know, so, uh, well, you, want you want us to go? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Patrice Guillory, Office of Reentry and Justice. Oh, uh, just as a guest, I'm Peter Kim with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. All right, uh, Jill Ray. Hi there, Jill Ray with um, Supervisor Candace Anderson's office. All right, Christopher. Afternoon, everyone. Chris James here with the W. Hayward Burns Institute. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kendra Carr, the co-director of the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. Ariana, you want to say something? <laughs> Good afternoon, Gariana Youngblood, Office of Reentry and Justice. Thank you all for your introductions. Um, oh, can you make me Liana? Oh, well, Liana, sorry about that. No worries, and I'm Liana Willis with the Office of Reentry and Justice. Okay, all right, cool. Thank you. And um, as, as of right now, do we go to public comments or what? Yeah, or you can ask for it if there are any announcements and then we can oh, God. So uh, at this time we'll ask uh, the committee if there's any announcements that you want to make. Uh feel free to do so at this time. Gigi. I guess we had a pretty successful event in Oakland through a contract we have with the state called Thug Therapy, and it's facilitated by Ms. Mr. Fab. And he talks about his adverse childhood experiences and how he was able to overcome them through um, utilizing inherent skills. He has as an African-American male, we have drumming, and it's gonna be at the Antioch Water Park. It's designed for individuals um, 16 and up. Um, there'll be a breakout group for women because as men um, talk about their challenges, we also need to have the females who support them understand how they can support them. And I will send them Flyers to Patrice and Patrice can then share it with the fuller community. We're hoping to have a, a big showing um, when we did it in Marin City a couple of months ago. Pretty much the whole city came out. It was wonderful and uh, a healing approach, recognizing that people don't want to heal from one approach. It has to be a variety of different approaches. And this one seems to capture the young urban men. Thank you. All right, sounds good, too. Uh, definitely make sure you get the flyer out. Um, anyone else have any announcements at this time? Mm -hmm. What, just from the committee or from? Uh, from the committee for now. No? Um, and so I'll also move into uh, uh, any public comments uh, at this time? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we got one back here, Mr. Kim. Yeah, so um, wanted to share this information with this committee, uh, this subcommittee, um, being community engagement. Um, based out of a conversation that was born out of the last full body RJOB meeting when uh, public defender McDonald had shared with the group a, a film called Judging Juries, a documentary about uh, lack of equity and representation on juries. Um, that kind of then led to a larger conversation uh, where the OREsj our office Kendra and I were really interested in hosting a screening of this documentary um, and we wanted to partner with both the public defender and the district attorney's office uh, to maybe sit on a panel for that screening um, and so and we wanted to have one screening in East West County one screening in East County 
Um, and it just so happened that the Rise Center, uh, so uh, Stephanie Medley, um, she was already in the works of, of arranging a similar screening. So long story short, we're now partnering, our office is partnering with Rise for a screening at their center of this documentary, Judge and Jury's Song, um, uh, what is that, I think the 16th, May 16th, if I'm getting, that's Thursday. Oh, my date is correct. It's a Thursday, May 16th at Rise at five o'clock. Um, and then I'm also in communication partnering with Safe, uh, the Safe Return Project folks. And we'll be hosting a screening in East County in Antioch. And right now the tentative date for that second screening is May 30th. Um, we'll have, for the first screening, we've already confirmed panelists, uh, Public Defender McDonald, DA Becton, um, a retired Alameda Court judge, uh, Judge Harvey Forte, who's also featured in the film. Um, and we may have another couple panelists as well. The one at Rise probably have a little more focus on young people, um, and then the one in Antioch, you will focus on the reentry population. Um, when we'll, I'll have all these details in a flyer form and share with the group, but wanted to first share with this subcommittee. Would love to have you all help us. Um, well, first, we want everyone in our, in our job to attend and, and welcome and invite you all. Um, but also, if we can even help spread the word about these screenings, that would be wonderful. Would you have anyone speaking from lived experience to go along with the paid professional staff? So, for the rise, um, for the rise screening, we're looking to having a young person um, be on the panel and even help facilitate. And for the Antioch screening, we say return. We're going to have someone who is a former, someone who's formerly incarcerated and also has been uh, impacted by the criminal justice system. Be on that panel. Perfect. So. Yeah. Uh, again, we'll, we'll be sending out more detailed information so you don't have to memorize that. Okay. That's just right. That's right. we'll, we'll be looking for that as well. Uh, anyone else with public comments? I also have one uh, announcement. So on uh, Monday, April 15th from 2 to 4 p.m., um, we're hosting our second community workshop for the Restorative Justice Initiative. Uh, we were able to release our um, assessment on needs and opportunities, uh, findings and recommendations, and have shared that out. Uh, it's also up on our website, so we really encourage folks to review that and, 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 and come to the workshop to give your feedback, your reactions, and your impressions of what um, the, that report lifted up. Um, from there, our next steps will be to identify a, a pilot project that we would then utilize our remaining Measure X funds to help support seeding more restorative justice work in the county. So we're lo really looking forward to it. April 15th from 2 to 4 p.m. at the Probation Department 50 Douglas um, in Martinez. Uh, we encourage you to register as early as possible. I know today's a Thursday. Um, and there is a, both a virtual option as well as you're able to attend in person. So if you need more info, just let me know. And then also for those of you in the room, we are um, having some issues with the air circulation, which is why the doors are, are open. So hopefully it'll help with cooling the space down a little bit. Um, and this is our backup meeting space. We will be back over at 50 Douglas for the next, uh, next month's meeting. Uh, we have a training going on there right now. So uh, we'll be back at 50 Douglas. That's it. All right. Is there anyone else with public comments at this time? I see no show of hands. Um, at this point, um, <clears throat> you approve the regular actions? Yeah, you can move to. <clears throat> Um, sorry about this. this is my first meeting that I'm on. Uh, so what you'll do here is um, you'll move to agenda item three and ask that folks review the record of actions and if they're ready to um, move forward with it, then you can call a motion or a vote to approve the record of action. All right. Uh, at this time, I'll do uh uh, approval of record of actions, and I will do a motion 
to uh, or ask for a motion to approve the record of actions at this time. So moved. Uh, can we get a second? Second. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, the. Oh, wait, now you got to vote. <laughs> oh. Right now, right now, I can take a roll call vote. Okay, that's fine. Would like. Yeah, please. Gigi Crowder. Present. Um, oh, yes, oh, to oh, approving oh, the record okay. of action. Oh, I'm sorry, sitting out in the flyer. Yes, I approve. <laughs> Marcus Walton. Yes. Ronnell Ellis. Yes. Motion carries. Um, <clears throat> so we need to go to page, right? Yeah, we're back on the front. So we'll move to uh, Jim next door. The, uh, this page, right? Yeah, so this is back here. So now we're on. And I'll help you out with this one. Let me see. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's discuss something again. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll discuss the new subcommittee chair and take a vote. Is that what? Is that correct? Yeah. So previously, uh, 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 Mr. Melvin Willis, uh, C uh, subcommittee member who served as chair, um, has um, asked to step down as chair, and so. Um, Ronell Ellis has agreed to potentially step up um, in the interim, um, so that way you can continue to have meetings move forward. And so at this time, we want to just at least take formal action, um, unless any other member here um, is interested in serving in a chair um, position that is still welcome. Is there anyone? <laughs> is there anyone? Is there anyone? <laughs> so, uh, so that's what's before you today. I move Ronell Ellis. <laughs> I second. Thank you, fine folks. Uh, so we need to take a vote. Um, uh, we move to vote on the uh, Ronell Ellis taking <laughs> taking up the chair position uh, for the subcommittee. Uh, Kendra. Gariana. I mean, yeah, Gariana, can you go ahead and do a roll call vote, please? Absolutely. Marcus Walton? Yes. Gigi Crowder? Yes. Ronnell Ellis? Yeah. <laughs> Motion carries. Yay! <laughs> All right. Too, Congratulations. Too excited about this. Um, and so uh, now we'll, um, we'll talk about, about the final, the role of the committee. Mm -hmm. Define and discuss a uh, role of um, our job uh, C subcommittee. So I think this came up and is Chris still on? Okay, there he is. Okay, so uh, and maybe he, he can also assist with this, but I think um, for some time now, um, the body, uh, this particular body, um, wanted to have some opportunities to really focus his work and really discuss. Um, ways to create a um, avenue or a platform, if you will, for further community engagement. Um, hence, what's in the name of the, of the subcommittee. Um, and then, a, is it here attached? Oh, well, actually, this is kind of in, in concert with agenda item number six as well, as you'll have an opportunity to review um, your previous uh, work plan. Um, but just want to create space for the subcommittee members to really think through and talk about um, some of your um, priorities for the next year and how then do you want to shape the role and the um, activities of this body that will really uh, serve the objectives um, that you all are hoping for for this year. So I would actually say probably five and, and six kind of go together. Think priority. Um, so we want to discuss, uh, the sheriff's office quarter report. Is that right? Number five? No, I think so. 
Okay. Oh. And then attachment to the this work. Yeah. So if it if it helps, because okay, let's keep separating this off. Yeah. So that way we can follow along there. And then that does definitely just one thing. Let me see if that helps me. Please bear with me, uh, everyone. You're doing great. Um. So, um, define the role and purpose for our job um, as CEO, CEO subcommittees. Um, I guess we're going to open up the floor to talk about that um, so that uh, anything we need to discuss regarding this matter uh, can be addressed at this time. Um, well, that looks <clears throat> like Chris has. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, um, so first of all, uh, I just want to say, excuse me, um, to you, Ronell, for stepping into this role. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when I when I called you, I didn't did not know that was going to be your answer. You you said yes way quicker than um, you might have folks believe based on how you just carried on when the actual formal vote happened. But you know, I. I Really, I think we all appreciate uh, the fact that you deem this work important enough to get involved in that way. And so, yeah, you, you're doing fine. It'll it'll get easier as you go. Um, just moving through the agendas and all of it, it'll be like clockwork to you before you know it. So uh, just keep plugging along. But you're doing a doing a great job and we appreciate you. Um, as far as this particular agenda item, I would say. <clears throat> to Patrice's point, like what what we're trying to do um, is make sure that the CEF, obviously now you have a number of uh, objectives uh, in a work plan or uh, in the overall recommendations that are geared sort of toward this subcommittee. But one of the things that's maybe not written in the recommendations or even written into the work plan specifically, but that this subcommittee, given its title and focus, um, should hold uh, is making sure that we have, you know, the attendance, the support, the engagement, um, interaction, feedback uh, of community members, right? Um, and, and trying to maximize that. Um, how do we get as many people as possible um, showing up to not just this meeting, but, you know, as many meetings as as the our job is going to have? Um, how do we make sure that folks in the community who want to be involved in this kind of uh, work know what the our job is, know what its charge is, uh, can weigh in, can be heard um, and can help to. Uh, move forward any of the items on um, any agenda that the R job has, um, be partners in this work uh, in the way that I think was always intended, uh, given that, you know, we we have an R job and had an RJTF because of, you know, community effort and community voice. So just wanting to think about, um, I think the way we framed this originally was was like, what if we took a couple of months to really try to build um, that level of engagement, that level of dialogue with community, and then started to look at these objectives again, as opposed to, um, you know, sort of trying to move objectives without having as much uh, support uh, or as much momentum as, you know, we might need to actually complete them. So, um it doesn't have to necessarily look that way, but we know that um, it, it would be a real big help, I think, to the overall work of this body at large if we had a vehicle by which to make sure as many folks in the community as possible are attending meetings, um, you know, whether virtually or in person. Um, weighing in and actually um, actively, that is, supporting the work that you all are doing. Yeah, 
I uh, I agree with that. I also wanted to know about the restrictions or the uh, boundaries of the committee. What can or cannot we do? Um, as far as do we have to hold all meetings in this room? Can we go out to the community? Can we schedule um, unconventional time time um, timelines for for meeting the public where they are or or what? So that's that's what I'm getting to. That's my my uh, goal as a uh, chair is to um, think outside the box and get outside of the norm. And, and um, because I, I work in the community anyway and I'm in the field, I do have a presence out there and I was trying to figure out, is there a way to bring the meeting to the public so that we can be engaged in, you know, in that way? Um, and I'm not sure what the restrictions are of the, of the body and what we, you know, are restricted to do as far as uh, where the space can be held, or we can just make it an event and not have to, you know, necessarily be a meeting, but try to engage the public so we can, you know, uh, recruit and, and solicit their, um, you know, their uh, presence into our, our uh, what we're trying to do. Yeah, I, I think what, uh, you know, Peter and Kendra, have taken on after hearing about what was gonna, what needed to happen and the recommendation from Alan about viewing that, we can host perhaps some things like that or be a presence there to say, rather than just us sitting here, me with no lived experience, I'd like to hear from the community. I serve as a cultural broker, but I wanna hear more people because when I'm in circles, they're complaining about things that happen that haven't benefited them, but we don't always open up the opportunity for the broader community. Like this time that we meet here makes it difficult for some people who might want to be here also from the public to also share their insights. So I like your idea of maybe having more flexibility with when and where we meet so that we can get a broader community. And, and I know there've been surveys and the restorative justice um, um, what are you calling it? Restorative justice initiative. Initiative work, but and it probably went to subject matter experts and a lot of individuals. But it would really choose most impacted. Generally, you don't from those type of surveys. So having an opportunity, even at that event, to open up dialogue and have more people who are more personally impacted lift their voice up would be important to me as well. Yeah, um, and because I work with that population and uh, also a, rep a representative in a, of the population, I do believe, I mean, you know, if you if you want to know something about law, they always go to a lawyer and they, they ask for, you know, uh, comments or, or, you know, um, you know, input or what they think about it, but, you know, along with any other occupation out there. So when you're talking about justice impacted folks, you do want to hear from justice impacted folks um, because that is the population who has um, been impacted the most, right? And we know um, incarceration and, you know, things of that nature impacts many people in the public, but it, it starts with that individual and then the families and, and so on and so forth uh, from there. So um, I I just see that, that vision of engagement going to another level and not just hoping folks can make it to a meeting during the day um, because it's almost difficult for us to make it here and it's part of our, you know, uh, our schedule. So um, I just, that's just where my head is. So um, I think it's time. I think Christopher, um, what you're saying is has, has a lot of weight to it and it is time to move. Uh, and get that engagement and then maybe, like you say, come back and then uh, truly uh, take those agenda items and put them into action and try to draw folks in so that we can have that, that presence from the public and collaborate and so we can get some things done. Um, I, I, so I appreciate all that. I I want to make sure, I guess, that we're sort of capturing the thoughts 
uh, in terms of so part part of this conversation seems like it's it's just naturally going toward uh, agenda item number seven, which is fine by me. Um, but I'm I'm curious if there are, um, you know, organizations, groups, spaces uh, that we should be engaging with that we should be reaching out to um or you know that we should be attempting to show up to to their meetings and such to say you know this exists and we're here here's who we are and what we do um you know and how to build that sort of exchange as well as the actual logistical changes to the meetings um you know to to allow for uh hopefully more community involvement and in reaching people where they are Yes, um, I will be willing to uh, start that process, uh, speaking with uh, some of the CBOs and the, the uh, community-based organizations and agencies uh, to collaborate and find out what they know about us and how can we, how can we, uh, you know, collaborate on several things uh, with the public. Um, I think that's what it's going to take. I don't think a lot of people from me. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with us as a body and what we do in the public uh, so much. I mean, I know we have people who sit on the board and then also in the in the overall general body who uh, belong to some of the agencies, but there's still a ton of agencies that aren't represented here. So um, I think that campaign needs to get on the, um, get on the way and I'll be uh, glad to head that up and uh, get started on uh, engagement with agencies and the public and start, uh, I guess, uh, designing some way to put this on paper as a first uh, engagement opportunity event type, you know, public engagement, whatever you want to call it, but it has to happen. And I, so I completely agree and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say, yes, that all sounds good. And also as the chair of this subcommittee, um, in addition to you sort of spearheading an effort like that, it's also important to, um, to have the collaboration of other folks there. Because that can become a pattern really quickly, right? Like as the chair, you can say, yes, I'll do X, I'll do Y, I'll do Z and A and B and C and one and two and three. And before you know it, it's too much. Um, so realistically, you know, if there are one or two organizations that you can reach out to, um, you know, that's a good enough start. I would be curious to know what, you know, the rest of us can do. Uh, to aid you in that effort or to follow your lead in that way so that you're not the only person responsible for, for doing such a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we know so many individuals are impacted and live with a mental health challenge. I could support you in bringing this conversation into the spaces with my colleagues and perhaps you're in education, you could do it because we, we're definitely needing to crack the school to prison pipeline and so prevalent in this county. Yeah, that would be an ask as well. Um, who could, in their own individual communities where we serve, if you could tap into those uh, uh, folks and then report back to me who is willing to hear what we have to say or how can we bring them into the fold and then we collaborate and bring them all together from each individual person who who can connect with those agencies to bring it, you know, to bring it to a like a pool, right? So um, I know I have several agencies. I'll probably say about anywhere between five to ten. Uh, Gigi, I don't know how many you connected with. Oh, more but, the mental health yeah. system. Marcus. We could do like a listening session and have the people in the host at NAMI and get people engaged so they understand the disparities that exist for people who live with mental illness. Right. So that's what that would be my um Marcus as well and, and everybody on the committee. Um I would be looking to uh, reach out to everyone and find out, you know, which agencies or which uh collaborating 
uh, CEOs or whatever, whoever we work with in these different areas between West County and East County and Central County, um, and then bring those those uh, individual uh, collaborations to the fold. And uh, we can we can do it in sections, or we can do it all and try to do it all in one while. And the reason why I say this is because my agency in particular brings the whole county together at times when we do uh, events or workshops or trainings or whatever. So I know it can be done. It'll just be being done for another reason. So it won't be a training or something uh, uh, uniform in, in terms of just uh, providing some kind of information, but it'll be to bring the public together with this body to uh, start that process of having a regular engaged uh, community, whether that be email lists and all this other stuff, so we can start really being in tune with the community. And so the community can get familiar with us and the work that we do, and we can get input from that community and try to implement some of the things that the community wants to be done. I think that's what, what we're trying to do. So uh, one more go thing. ahead, Patricia. Um, so actually, just literally earlier this morning, um, the AB 109 Community Advisory Board was just having this a similar conversation about wanting to um, really engage with folks with lived experiences to actually increase more of their presence on um, the board. Um, and over the years, the CAB has now grown to have a, a quite few, I, I would probably say, I'm not surprised, maybe half or close to half of the members on CAB are folks with lived experiences. Certainly the entire officer um, list, if you will, are all uh, folks with lived experiences. And so, but um, they did talk about um, wanting to go out and do some presentations. Um, and so I think maybe possibly a joint effort between the two county um, boards that are looking to do the exact same thing. Um, granted, with some nuances there, but it's certainly there's there's a, definitely a lot of commonality uh, between what you guys are attempting to do. So I would also recommend maybe bridging um, partnership with that body as well. Um, RJ would be more than happy to help facilitate that. Yeah, I'm also under the impression that CAB has funding too, so uh, that might be another thing, no? What, okay. what funding? For themselves or for the... Oh, <laughs> the community and do some do some work. So, uh, yeah, we'd be looking to uh, definitely speaking with you and the rest of your the folks you work with on CAB. You still working on CAB? Yeah, yeah, we still staff that. Right. So, um, but yeah, definitely, that's that's what we're talking about because um, even working with Mr. Kim and uh, uh, what they're doing, you know, as a as a, as a you know overseeing body, uh, we want to collaborate with everybody. I think the word gets out better that way. And you reach more people. So, you know, no stone unturn, unturned. And um, I just think this is the next move for the body is, is, is to implement, right? So execution, uh, plan and execution. So um, I'm excited about that part of it because that's the part that I'm most familiar with, right? Is uh, the grassroots, the on, boots on the ground type thing. So uh, I'm just looking forward to that, that piece. Man, also just I want us to make sure that we are also coordinating with JJCC folks, uh, if that's cat and because uh, early on, and I don't know if the work is diverged a little bit, but early on, we were um, sort of replicating some work, and so there were some some things that were very similar, and I would want to make sure that we are um, coordinating with. The work that's happening there as well and so maybe cab is an opportunity to bring all of those things together so that's just um something that i would really need to, need to, to do um more of is there a special way we can find that out if, if we're other i guess just to collaborate with JCC, or do we should we collaborate with CAB to get that to make sure that that's happening? I, I'm, what I'm, I'm the uh, curious what the um, 
best way for us to, um, what staff says best way for us to do that kind of collaboration and be interested in, in their um, viewpoint. Um, because I'm no longer on one of the JJCC subcommittees, someone else is in my office has taken that and I'll, I'll admit we have not coordinated properly closely enough in my office to make sure that we know what the other's doing. So, um, you know, everyone has uh, a lot that they're they're doing. So we should probably figure out um, what the folks in, I should figure out what the folks in my office are doing, but I think as a larger I, I can at least um, um, give update at least around JJCC. So the two subcommittees that were in place have now consolidated to one subcommittee um, called EPIC. <laughs> um, and EPIC stands for, oh man, I think I'm gonna mess it up. Uh, effective Prevention. Prevention. Integrated community. There we go. Okay. You got it before I did. <laughs> well, I, 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 I looked up to see you where, where they were. So. Yeah. And so um, uh, I think a good chunk of their work at the moment is um, really looking at those two pieces between the prevention, uh, continuing to move forward with putting a lot of uh, emphasis around what prevention work can be done in the county to um, move young people away from uh, juvenile justice system involvement, um, while also trying to get a sense of the existing services that are um, are in place, with sort of the nature of those uh, of those services, um, and you know what what are um, just some other opportunities potentially to to expand. So um, that's not to say that there isn't a concern a concerted effort or a prioritization on. Um, the inclusion of, of young people with lived experiences, but just know that that for that subcommittee, that's been like sort of the primary focus as of as of late. And they just kind of within the last maybe two months just came together as a new um, subcommittee. I'm saying two months, it could be a little longer, three, four, something like that. Can I also, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, we're no, on the same topic. You can go ahead. I'll wait. Uh, so I, you know, speaking of, you know, youth with shared experiences, one of the things that we tried to do in 2021, maybe here, was to get a youth advisory council as well. And so I I know that, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe the JJCC work it took, you know, took that on, et cetera. But um, th th that's just an example of some of the, you know, we had a priority here that, JGCC was also sort of working on, and I'd like to make sure that we're working together as opposed to cross purposes um, and not duplicating work, um, but sort of um, amplifying work as opposed. So um, that's just as an example. Um, some of the things that have happened in the past that I want to make sure that we're um, aware of. Um, since a lot of there's a lot of overlap between them. So I apologize. I'll acknowledge that I do not know what JJC is, but it's not part of the acronym. So I went back. Oh, I'm sorry. Juvenile Thank Justice you. Coordinating Council. Yes. Yes. Apologies. Yeah. yeah. Just not on here. So but I wanted to say that um I always look ahead. And so I'm on the care court um planning committee. I'm not sure if any individuals are aware of the fact that in every county now. They have to implement care court and care court is an opportunity for individuals who have cycled in and out of psych emergency services and sometimes jail, a lot of times jail when there are people of, uh, from BIPOC communities, largely African American assistance, but racial justice. Uh, that's why I got on because I knew care court was coming and I knew we could easily fail that group of individuals again if we didn't have intentional opportunities as we felt them, in my opinion, with the assistant outpatient treatment program and behavioral health court and other places when they're seen as entitlement programs, all of a sudden they get a lot lighter and they're not the target population who struggles most when they live with mental illness or who I like to call the most harm. So I would like to somehow uh, collaborate in this effort with 
looking at what we need to have in place so that the care court programs and programs that are on the horizon that could make a difference around um, the reentry population, but for those who live with mental illness or substance use, because a lot of times that's when they keep cycling back in. They are largely untreated. In this county, they're largely African-American males, and we have not done a good job of addressing that need. So I, had, I was on a meeting earlier today, and the criteria that will be used for care court doesn't immediately address that group of individuals. And so it has to be targeted efforts to make sure, because it's this belief system that everybody, once they're ready to get services, can get services. No, that's not true. So it's people out there who would be ready to come and get their mental health treated, but they have to know about the program. So I, I know we, we fail miserably in this county with people even knowing what exists for them. So if well, I did something like Supporting this effort here, I will want to do it with a care court theme with some real actionable items about how we can make sure those individuals that I consider the most harmed get their needs met through this big initiative that most people are not even aware of. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because when I um, deal with MH and uh, substance use and incarceration and reentry and you uh you know when they're all in jail they're all in general but yep. when it's time for treatment or uh something like that they get separated out so when you talk about a mental health person who may have been you know incarcerated or something like that when it's time for them to come out and get housing they can't go to a, a regular housing facility or SLE or something like that because they're not equipped to deal with mental health, which means now the person with the mental health because of the one diagnosis, even though they may have two or three diagnoses, now doesn't qualify for that housing. So where is the specific housing, right? Uh, diagnosis specific housing so that the person can get what they need. And so that's where you start running into problems when it's time to treat. Yep. And so when they're all incarcerated, everybody's in the same pod, Everybody's kind of running around doing what they do, but when it's time for treatment or being released or going into reentry, then it gets real specific. And so uh, um, that's where I think the services uh, fall short. And uh, when a person gets out and can't be treated properly, then you have issues and problems arise. And um, how those how those income how those outcomes uh, are affected. Is, is by all of that as well. So um, it's important that when you're talking about specific things like MH, um, that it gets its own. I also think that it doesn't get uh, shuffled into the general population of uh, reentry and stuff. It's different. So you have to be specific with that. Um, that's something we need to get out there. And then, like you say, those targeted communities with MH treatment their voice needs to be heard on how they need to be uh, funded or how they need to be addressed or, or you know, looked at or examined so uh, so that the, the folks who are coming out can get what they need going back into the public. Um, so, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, and that's why I think it's important that this body try to be an advocate for all of those different uh issues uh has to be able to voice that and, and reach the folks that uh that want to hear it so could this body help support me on um, lifting that up with uh, maybe just uh what you need to know about care court and how it will impact uh, individuals who um are are off too often fall through the cracks because that mean the family members call with their delegate and they're not but the criteria that's being used won't immediately capture them without us showing the parents how to do it or the community how to get the petitions for those individuals to perhaps most counties don't tap into who they could get services to because most people don't understand it's a mental illness it's not a substance abuse they're not a bad person they don't keep committing these crimes unless they're untreated so i would like to do something like that that and get support from your office and your office to make sure the right people are in the room. 
Well, I think uh, if I'm correct, or uh, correct me. do it and then not connect with you guys. But if we um, put reach the public, that's part of it, right? Okay. That's what I'm saying. It, it, it carries more weight if I could say I'm collaborating with. But I, I'd already decided to do it anyhow, because I can't have another failed opportunity for folks. Because I think we cover a lot of ground with this with this body being a racial justice, period. So if you if it's racial justice and you fall under the racial justice, you know, uh, initiative, then I mean that should cover whoever's incarcerated, right? And, and justice impact. But yes, justice impact. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I don't I don't see why we would be excluded. Or leave well, it I'll out never include, but I'm, I'm, not sure I'm, I'm saying that I'm here as an elder rather right. than a faith. Before right. I got here, we didn't have a category for behavioral health or mental health, which was mind boggling to me. But uh, what, what I'm saying is, I don't see why we as a body would exclude anybody. So we should be able to do something. When we speak it out there in the public and try to get the public engaged. The image it makes population is part of it. Of course. Yeah, so I don't ninety-nine percent of us. Yeah. So I mean, you know, there's there's diagnosed and there's undiagnosed, right? So COVID impacted all of us though. Some of us right. didn't have as severe, yeah. but everybody did with anxiety and depression. So I'm, uh, here's an opportunity. Yeah, I am just I'm just under the impression that uh we're gonna we're gonna cover all those bases. Yeah, I don't, I don't see Oh, I mean, I, I just, I just see inclusion on that. So, thank you, Chris. You got something you want to add? I, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> just want to make sure, um, we kind of know what our next steps are, uh, so we can be accountable to them, and and um, everybody can have a hand in supporting as much as possible. Right? It's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a committee wide um effort not a not a chair or an individual effort um so we're all going to need to play a role in in making sure that you know we're we're able to get the word out uh hopefully get more people involved um and then really take in and incorporate uh their feedback and you know sort of define successes in addition to sort of the the charge that you all already have along with community so looking forward to to doing that work with you all well, I'm also under the impression that time is of essence as of right now, um, it's approaching four o'clock. Um, is it something we can do right now to uh, secure that the direction we're going in with uh, next steps as far as um, reaching out to several local agencies and, and CBOs to find out who's on board, who will be uh, willing to work with us um, and attend or get the public that they're associated with to uh, or out to or the word out to uh, the public so that we can uh, engage with them? I, I mean, I, I think the number one thing we could do within this meeting space, um, potentially, is to compile a list of those organizations um, and then a list of the you know commitments or who is committing to doing some of that reaching out uh, that way next month um, you know we know who we expect to hear from to say I reached out to whoever this was the result um, I'm going to be putting you in touch or you know the next step will be you know etc um, just so that we have some accountability for it and we make sure it's happening otherwise um, it's it's very easy for it to get sort of lost um, in like we committed to it, meant that at the time that we said it, and then life happened after this meeting, and then we get back to this meeting and we're like, oh yeah, I was supposed to do that. Um, so just sort of making sure that we have something on record, um, not even that it has to be like um, something that is necessary, like published for an agenda, not a bad idea necessarily for the next one, but it doesn't have to be just so that we have something. Um, I mean, I guess it probably actually would be that um, because we'd want to come back to it the next month and see what what the progress has been. Um, but just making sure that we have on paper somewhere um, what the organizations are uh, that we're trying to reach out to, who's going to be responsible for doing that so that we can follow up from there. So, like, 
clarifying question, are we reaching out so that they can attend CEF meetings? Are we reaching out so that we can put together a mental health forum? Are we reaching out so that they can be more engaged with the RJOB larger body? What, what is the specific ask of the organizations? Yeah, so this, in terms of uh, for the purpose of this agenda item, it was reaching out to say, and, it, and it's not necessarily to say, whoever I'm on the phone with, can you please show up to a meeting? But it might be, um, you know, this is a body that does work that uh, the population that you serve or the people who attend your meeting might be interested in. Is it possible um, that we could share some information with you or, you know, attend a meeting to talk about what we're doing, something like that, um, so as to get the word out? And that's for the CEF or is that the, we're doing this on behalf of the larger RJOB that we want more folks. Obviously, I hear the subcommittee, but are we also saying we want more uh, attendance at the greater RJOB meetings? So that's a great question. I think um, the way that I look at it, particularly given that we we are talking about, um, or at least starting to have the conversation about meeting logistics, um, it occurs to me that it may become a lot easier if we're trying to rearrange meeting logistics for community to be able to attend or for these meetings to happen in places where community um, are, are more likely to be and at times where they're more likely to be available, that this subcommittee could be the um, could be the vehicle, at least for folks finding out even what's happening within the R job. And then if folks feel, you know, based on any update in particular that they need to show up to another subcommittee meeting, uh, they they are always welcome to do that. Um, so I, I would I would start with this, especially because this is the only meeting so far where I think, you know, folks are actually having a conversation about does this need to happen outside of the hours of nine to five? And does this need to happen in a different location? Um, and so I, I would I would lead with that. I would lead with the subcommittee as a vehicle potentially to uh, more involvement with the R job at large. Yeah, also to ask, right, of these organizations, what do they need, right, to help us, for us to help them get folks engaged and, you know, with us as well. So they might have some ideas as to, um, you know, how to bring them forward so that we can engage with, with the folks in the community and put our heads together and, you know, see what we come up with. But um, definitely um, that that sparks interest for me as to uh, being in, in line and in communication with those folks so that we can bring the, the greater population in. And I think, it, I think it covers everything. You want people to come to the meetings. You want people to be engage in the public, you want them to give us feedback on what they want. Part of this is supposed to be uh, what we're bringing as a liaison of the community to, uh, you know, the um, board of supervisors or whoever else. Um, how can we bring that information to this, to that board? So if that's going to happen, we need to get it from the people who uh, deserve the most. Yeah. So um, it's kind of like you know, informal how it happens, but we'll get to how it happens. Uh, starting with the engagement, uh, just trying to trying to go based on the, the title of the, of the body, community engagement, and uh, you know, the funding part is is you know, that might be a whole other discussion. Yeah, that's why I need to get out of yeah. it. I want to know what the funding part because when I needed funding to address what was happening yeah. in Benia, there no, there was none. So how how the what's the responsibility of this body around funding? Are we making funding recommendations to improve outcomes for individuals, recognizing there's some racial injustice that takes place in our system? Or is there funding available to advance efforts to remove some of the disparities? 
I, I was never clear on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, just in alignment with the original um, set of the racial justice task force um, recommendations, the primary funding element or two of the primary fu funding elements within that was to establish a community capacity fund, um, which has been talked about in, in the past. And then also wanting to see increased um, investments in um, realignment funding for community services. So again, the, through the AB 109 reentry uh, element, but um, you know, certainly always something that you all can speak to in addition in addition to what the work recommendations that call for. So is there a budget now with money in it or no? No, there never was. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, no, our job was never provided uh, with policy driven. Yeah, it was always to steer the implementation of the 17 or so, 18 or so um recommendations racial justice task force came up with. And the structure of the body was to, it, which incorporated a lot of your county departments, was to lend itself to partnering with those agencies to then support their implementation of some of these uh, recommendations um, where applicable. So, but no, the body was never allocated any resource. It doesn't have its own standalone um, budget. It is a it serves as an advisory to forest supervisors. Mm -hmm. Patrice, can you, and forgive me, I should be better, my memory should be better, and I should have about more ready, ready access to my notes, but when we did the community capacity work, funding work, didn't the job take that to the Board of Supervisors? It was uh, a, an initial overview of the idea of what the fund would, would look like was presented to not the full board, but to the um, Public Protections Committee. Um, I think uh, where things left off was um, they wanting a little bit clearer, um, I don't want to say direction, but I guess wanted the proposal a little bit more beefed up, if you will, with a greater details. Um, and so it's kind of been pushed back to the committee to work those pieces out. And then Chris has his hand raised up. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so um, with the community capacity fund, um, basically we, we had some really great presentations um, some years back now, um, came up with a sort of a two prong or two tier strategy for how that was supposed to go, uh, essentially with some CBOs being able to get a relatively small amount of funding. Like, um, I don't even want to throw out an example, but a, a relatively small, like one time, uh, sort of infusion of cash and then other, um, organizations being able to get a much larger investment, but along with that, a lot of, um, you know, training and capacity building, right? So they would get this larger sum, but also need to uh, agree to participate in a number of uh, training and capacity building sessions over a certain period of time to get it. Um, and that way, we're able to you know, sort of build capacity on both fronts with the recognition that some organizations may be so new, so understaffed, what have you, that they may not be able or be ready at the at the moment um, to take on that much bigger commitment um, in terms of all of the various facets of development for a CBO, uh, but still wanting to have them be able to participate in some meaningful way or invest in them and what they're doing. Um, so after arriving at that conclusion, it was just, um, you know, the the subcommittee recognizing that having agreed on that, there was nothing else really that the subcommittee itself should do that we needed to bring in a TA provider to stand this up. Um, and so that was the the ask uh, of the um, the PPC, I think it was at that time, right, was um the recommendation was to to get a, a TA provider who would uh, sort of sort out the nuts and bolts of 
you know, what this should be, what the process, um, you know, for uh, qualifying organizations should be, so on and so forth, so that the R job itself or its members were not trying to stand that up or, or staffing the actual development of the fund as much as having proposed something that's going to basically have these components to it. And now we need someone who can come in and actually build it out. And so right now the, the, the PP, the public protection plan. Yeah. Public protection, PPC is sort of, sort of left it there. And well, so, yeah. So since then the, um, our job body is now, uh, referred to the equity committee, which is the same members. <laughs> so, uh, luckily we don't have to, you know, rehash a whole lot, but, um, at the last um, update to the equity committee, I think where um, the direction was to have our job really prioritize uh, across all of its recommendations, quite honestly, prioritize which which ones they want to move forward on to bring that back to the equity committee and start having discussion from there, which side note, April 15th on Monday at 1030, um, there will be a job update presented to um, the equity committee. So I encourage you all to attend. Uh, yeah. yeah, I do. I have one question around the like funding in county contracts where department heads who have to make decisions if they are a department head in this arena with criminal justice. Is there any language in their contract when they provide contracts to providers that part of your charge is to reduce racial? Disparity. Well, like have an equity metric, for yeah. example. With, so with when you're in, I don't know a contract because for me, it's not about a dollar amount going in. It's about in order for you to get funds and distribute them to your con subcontractors, right? Because the department gets the funding from wherever, county taxpayers dollars, and then they distribute them to CBOs. It just 2024, every CBO should have in their contract with the county uh, equity plan on how they're going to do the work with the dollars to improve outcomes. It, it makes no sense for us to just keep giving dollars to organization and us seeing the disparity that exists when we have a body like this meeting. It's not about dollars at some point. It's, be, it's about intention on improving outcomes. Yeah, I can't speak to all the departments. I'm sure that's something that Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice is probably looking into, but I can say um, with uh, the contracts that the commissioner holds and uh, that we administer through Office of Re uh, uh, Range and Justice, uh, we do require demographic um, reporting. Mm -hmm. We do not have spe specific um, equity like requirements or metrics, so to speak, but we do at least look at um, certain uh, demographic breakdowns so we can see who in fact is being referred in to these resources and then who are actually being engaged in and, and actually utilizing um, those resources. Right, but a next step might be. But it, yeah, that would be, yeah. I mean, a great and tool. I could see myself in a group like this trying to support that effort. Like if you're getting the money, don't be a part of the problem, be a part of the solution with, I don't, I, I can see who clearly is the group of people that they're serving. Mm -hmm. that has to change. Yeah, and I think that a lot of that would have to be like training, having some tools in place. So mm -hmm. most of, because it, it, I, I, what I would certainly um, uh, put a uh, shine a light on is that the, the, the need to have um, um, data that's disaggregated. So you can first start off by establishing your baseline, who in fact are, who's your target population mm -hmm. and what, what are your various subgroups within that? And then if you are seeing between those who are referred in versus those who are utilizing the services, a significant drop within some of those subgroups, now we need to have something in place to help increase right that engagement among some of those within that, that uh, subgroup. I would say decrease. I, I mean, from, I guess, yes. From yeah. My like, yeah. And I'm speaking yeah. from the perspective of the research that we have available for just as impacted individuals yeah. after they've already been in the system. Yeah. But I see what you're saying from the other lens as well. And then, and then okay, uh, Gigi has to go real quick, but I did want to see if I could open up for public comment real quick and hear from Mr. Kim if that's okay with the uh, committee. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, this is a great conversation. I just had a couple kind of questions and some clarification, but just to respond to that last one, um, OREJ, Kendra, and I are really working on how do we kind of look at internal policies and practices within the county that really do center and embed um, equity, particularly racial equity, in all the kind of decision making processes. Um, our first staff has been working with each department about a budget equity tool. We're trying to first work with them on the budget equity statements that they each have and those specifically and point to in very specific ways to each department's budget where equity is being threatened. The next step is then for us to develop this tool like Patricia talked about to help departments actually uh, get a lot more grounded and intentional I and mean, explicit about how it is that they're addressing equity uh, in their work. And, and often we know it starts in the budget. How are you investing your money? Who are you actually assigning to oversee and, and make sure that these things happen? Um, and ultimately, how are you informing your decisions and your policies? Where are you bringing community in to kind of help those decisions um, and inform those decisions? Ultimately, we want to lead to every department then creating a racial equity plan, which is putting those statements, those aspirations into action in real concrete ways. And one of those ways, I think, Gigi, what you're talking about is procurement is a yes. classic example of a space and an opportunity to get better at being intentional and actually addressing racial inequity. So, for instance, if you want to put in a deliverable in a contract for someone to meet, are you explicitly like naming, like, we want to look at outcomes, mm -hmm. aspirations and values is great, but ultimately outcomes, like, Name your outcomes. Is it to increase high school graduation rates of African American young people in our schools, right? Or is it to de to to increase the number of um, living wage jobs that uh, you know uh, uh, people of color ages eighteen to forty are, are getting? And then you can attach those to actual milestones and deliverables to see if you're successful in that. And I think that's kind of what we're getting to. But but. Going back to this conversation about community engagement, I just have some questions. So um, if the task of this committee is to get more out into the community, just let people know what it is you're doing, and then to get them into these spaces to help inform your decisions, and ultimately, I think, to provide voice so that when you're in front of the equity committee and ultimately, ultimately to board of supervisors, it's not your just it's not just your voice, it's just a single report that's getting presented, but now you've got community support to kind of back up and, and advocate for those things. Um, may is it possible to maybe focus your community engagement activities around your specific goals that you've already named? So rather than just kind of open up to all the different things that are equity related. Why don't you look specifically at your recommendations and your priorities for this year and maybe organize some kind of event to help kind of talk to the community about this is one of our goals. What do you think? And, and then I think it makes it easier if you put that out there to your community partners, then they can just actually respond. Sure, I can send that information out and invite people to an event when you have it and where it's going to be at. Then you can say, well, we need a partner with you. Can we have to your space? I mean, I think just the more concrete it is, the more uh, it's going to be easier to get people on board to partner with and to see yes or no, I, I can help. I don't know if that makes sense. We have to yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, that's where we at, though. This body has been done some things, but this part we haven't done at all, right, as far as engagement. So to me, you got to start somewhere, right? And so are we willing? Hands go up, yay, nay. What we willing to do, how we willing to do it, let's get busy, let's hit it, let's hit it. Um, and try to get that engagement. I mean, the plan, like uh, like Christopher said, um, try to, you know, do our fillers, see who's interested, this and that other, get that involvement. And then we have things on paper already, want to do. So you, have, you, you say what you want to do, and then boom, that's when you know you have a target base. You say, this is where we want you to come, this is what we want you to do. So, um, you know, we're just trying to adopt that now, but uh, go, ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, because I know, uh, just so everyone knows, uh, we, we will have to end in just a, uh, we will be ending a little early, um, but really quickly what we could do just to um, put the button at, or period into this sentence is that maybe at our next uh, chair's agenda planning meeting, given that the last quarterly meeting, the whole body sort of identified what its priorities were going to be, um, and then maybe at, with the with the chair's 
identify of those priorities, which one do we want to take out into the community and then maybe bring it back to the next CEF meeting yeah. and then start talking about how to maybe organize around that. Yeah. Does that sound? So, so plan. Okay. All right. Well, let's do that. Uh, what Patrice said. <laughs> so finally, um, we'll, we'll take that up right now. Okay. So um, uh, go ahead, Judy. I was also going to say if we wanted to change location just for meetings, we have the capacity in Central the central part of the county um, in Concord to have hybrid meetings as well. We just want to not always have to come to Martinez because we live. Oh, who does a hybrid? Yeah, well, I'll talk with you afterwards. Okay. I'll identify that location. Yeah. Yeah. That might be an easy way to get the community partnership yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. We'll ask, can we use your space? Like, yeah. go one, one month we have a space of these two. So. so, and we'll add that to maybe the agenda next time is to talk, add back the meeting logistics so we can talk that through. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. All right. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Uh, so now we yeah. have forum. So yeah. we have the 